Day 94. Your love for us is so much greater than we could ever know. You want to take us to new heights, new destinations, and you desire to give us the desires of our hearts when we delight ourselves in you. So I thank you today for making one of my dreams come true. Wasn't that incredible? I've got to say a big mahalo and thank you to my friends for taking us up on that private plane today to the Grand Canyon. And I really felt like this was such a love note from the Lord because I have been for the past month asking my husband to go to the Grand Canyon. We were going to drive and take our kids to go see it, but this was such a blessing and a true testament to the Bible saying, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So really grateful this morning to have been able to see the wonder and the awe of God's creation. Well, it's day 94 and we're in Judges chapters 13 through 15. And how are you guys doing after that audio debacle yesterday on chapter 12? I know it was a little bit freakish. I know that it sounded like Satan was coming out of your speakers, but hear me when I say, I think I pressed the slow-mo button. And when I edited it, it seemed like it was okay because on the front and the back end of slow-mo clips, it's normal speed. And so that is why it ended up slowing down right there in the middle. I hope that it didn't deter you from watching the rest of the video because I believe the end of it was really powerful, especially for those who may be weary, who may be tired, and who may be spiritually spiritually broken. So I encourage you if you did freak out and hit that stop button to go back and watch the end of the video. But nevertheless, we are going to cover chapter 12 today. And if that ever happens again, do know that you can change the speed of the playback here on YouTube. You can actually click the button to either slow me down because I know I talk fast or you can speed it up. And I know that there were some people who went ahead and chose that option yesterday to finish out the chapter. Otherwise, if you're new here, welcome. Let me know where you're watching from. Also, if everyone could help us out by liking this video, making sure you're subscribed to the channel and hitting that notification bell so you know when all of the videos drop each day. Also, make sure you're connected with us in our Facebook group. Everyone is such a champion for one another in their faith and the way that they are growing in the relationship with Christ. So I thank you so much, Lord, for this day. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let it not be our selfish desires that we seek today, but your true and perfect well. Give us this day our daily bread as we read your word, Lord. I pray that you will speak. I pray your Holy Spirit will come down like a rushing wind. I pray that you will breathe upon it so it comes to life for each and every one of us, that you will speak to us so personally, Lord, even when the words aren't audibly spoken. I pray that you'll speak into our spirits in such a powerful way. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us, who have hurt us, and lead us not into temptation but delivers from evil any plans that the enemy has against us. I pray that you put an end and a stop to them right now in the name of Jesus. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. We love you in Jesus name. Amen. Now, I definitely don't like to give the devil too much credit for things in life, but if that was, in fact, an attack, or if he used this opportunity of that video slowing down to keep people from watching the video, well, we're going to resist him, and he will flee, which he did so at the end of the video. And here we are wrapping up chapter 12, which is a short but a powerful chapter, and one that is important that we do not skip over. So the men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. Well, doesn't this sound familiar? Remember back in chapter 8 when they did the same thing and were like, Why didn't you call us to fight? You called us last, and they were criticizing uh, the way that they went to war. Well, now they're once again jealous of the fact that they weren't called to war. They want credit for work that they weren't even willing to do in the first place. So we're going to start off with a heart check here, which I didn't even do yesterday. Are you willing to work and do things without receiving credit? Are you willing to help others when they aren't grateful? Are you willing to do things for those who may not say thank you or recognize you for your efforts? So not only does Ephraim want to fire Jephthah, but they literally want him to burn. Verse three, and Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you didn't save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I went ahead and I took my life in my hand and I crossed over against the Ammonites and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day? 
finally, now, to fight against me. Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. So here we are seeing the beginning of the civil wars in Israel, brother against brother. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, you are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. So this was similar to when they uh, cut off the water source. These were actually crossing points. So them capturing this would keep keep them from being able to go into the land. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, let me go over, they want to go home. The men of Gilead said to him, are you an Ephraimite? And when he said, no, they said to him, then say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. So this is showing the difference in the dialect, which was a dead giveaway for the Ephraimites. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. That's a lot of people who died in this civil war, which is really heartbreaking to see that this is happening here. Jephthah judged Israel for six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. So we're seeing a classic case of the speech betraying the Ephraimites. And what's interesting here is that Jephthah was so different. Remember, he's a man of war. He's a fighter. And remember when Gideon, the Ephraimites, came up against him? Gideon sweet-talked the Ephraimites. He's like, y'all have done way more than me. Why are you getting upset? Don't be upset about it. But Jephthah was like, you guys want to fight? Let's throw down right now. So such a contrast between the two judges. And here at the end of the chapter, we see the ninth, 10th, and 11th judges rising up. After him, Ibzen of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He gave in marriage outside his clan. And 30 daughters he brought in from outside for his sons. So clearly not a God-fearing man here. The fact that he's marrying his uh, daughters off to people outside of the clan and 30 daughters he's bringing in from outside. He judged Israel for seven years. And then Ibsen died and was buried at Bethlehem. After him, Elon, the Zebulonite, judged Israel and he judged Israel 10 years. Then Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried at Ijalon in the land of Zebulun. After him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite, judged Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys and he judged Israel eight years. So clearly these men... Uh, are involved in polygamy, again, not condoned by God, but just a part of this day in the way that it was. And Abdon was probably very rich, the fact that he has 70 donkeys. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirathonite, died and was buried at Pirathon in the land of Ephraim in the hill country of the Amalekites. So these guys held the position, but really not a lot of significance, which is why uh, such a short uh, section written about these three judges. Now we begin... One of the more interesting stories of Judges, the rise of Samson, the 12th judge, probably one of the more classic stories of the Bible. We know it as Samson and Delilah, but here we're being introduced to his life in chapter 13. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So this is that same story being told over again. We're seeing victory followed by sin, backsliding, and then the Lord handing them over to their sin. And the, they were oppressed by the Philistines for 40 years. Now, when we take a look at the Philistines, these were strong seafaring people. They were originally from Crete. They settled in the coastal areas of Israel. They built five cities, but dominated clearly here for 40 years. They were proficient in smelting iron, so they had advanced weaponry. And they were always at war with Israel. And they were known because they were uncircumcised. Which, of course, we know for Israel, they had to be circumcised. This was a part of their consecration and being set apart. And Samson actually means son, or at least part of his name means son. The significance of that... I read it could have been because he was from Beth Shemesh or it could have been because of the sun god Shemash. But I also read another meaning of his name and I can't remember what it was, but it didn't seem like there was a lot of significance with the fact that his name had a meaning of sun. But if anybody has anything on that, let me know. Verse two, there was a certain man of Zorah. Zorah was the foothills west of Jerusalem near Philistine territory by Judah. 
of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and he had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and you have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Sounds familiar, right? With the way that the angel of the Lord came to Mary and said this. But this won't be immaculate conception. Verse four, therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So this is a Nazarite vow being given to Samson's mother on behalf of him. So she has to take this vow in a sense that she cannot drink alcohol. But normally Nazarite vows, if you remember from Numbers chapter 6, it was a voluntary vow. Well, we know that Samson's is not. It's being directed upon him. Um, it usually was going to be for a limited duration, but Samson's will be a lifelong vow. They would have to abstain from alcohol, not uh, cut their hair. They would have no contact with dead, which we will see Samson here in these first couple of chapters break all of these rules. And both Samson, again, and his mother were told to follow these rules. And we see some foreshadowing here. The fact that it says he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So he will start this, but he won't finish it. So it's suggestive that he won't end up completing this mission. And it will be temporary that they will be handed over from the hands of the Philistines or from this oppression. And so the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. So she knows that this is likely God himself, which we know it is. I did not ask him where he was from and he did not tell me his name. So she was so in awe of him. It's the fact that she says very awesome that she didn't even ask his name or where he was from. She just simply listened to what he said, which was behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So again, lasting throughout his lifetime. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us to teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. So he is not only seeking confirmation of what his wife claimed to have been told, um, and I believe that that is a good trait of the husband to do because I think this could have easily been written off as something crazy. You know, he could have been like, woman, you're nuts. But instead he went to the Lord. And so this is showing that he is a godly man. And he could have easily rejected what his wife said, but instead he is asking the Lord for confirmation. And not only that, but he wants the Lord to teach him what they are to do with the child, how they are to raise him up. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. So he honored this prayer and the angel of God came again to the woman. So <laughs> it's interesting that the angel didn't go to him. Uh, the angel goes to the woman as she sat in the field. So it's likely that her husband was probably uh, plowing the fields, working the fields, and she was probably out there. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And of course, we know that he appeared to her in response to her husband's prayer. So this is showing kind of a mutuality, a mutual respect between husband and wife and the Lord working among that. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, are you the man who spoke to this woman? So this is showing that the husband is following after the wife. Again, showing that mutual respect and submission. And he said, I am. Isn't that just like the Lord to answer with his character? He is the great I am. And Manoah said, now when your words come true, what is to be the child manner of life and what is his mission? So again, they are asking, what is going to be of this child? What is his will? And so often we ask that ourselves, Lord, what is my will? What is this that you have for me? What do you want me to do? And here's what's interesting, what the Lord says. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I've said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So his answer to this question was simply obey. And this is also a powerful example of how we are to be examples for our children. It's not what we say to them. It's not the rules that we set for them, but it's who we are. It's what we do and what we show them that will be the example that we set for them to be. So her not 
drinking and eating unclean things, simply being obedient to what the Lord has called her to do will be the best example for her as a mother. Same thing for us as parents, to be obedient to God and everything that he calls us to be and do. Verse 15, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. But the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. Now for us, this is a dead giveaway that this is Jesus himself, because we know from Isaiah 9, Verse six, his name is wonderful, counselor, almighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And not only that, but he will show himself as wonderful when he does a wondrous work, when he ascends on this offering. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching probably in awe. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. And now Manoah and his wife were watching and they fell on their faces to the ground. Verse 21, then the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die for we have seen God. So this was just like Gideon, when he also had an encounter with the Lord. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. I feel like we can take so many notes from this couple and the way that they treat each other. Here we are seeing the wife, instead of criticizing her husband coming out of this moment, she instead encourages him. And I love what she says, that God would never do all of this just to destroy us. And it's just the way that the father continues to be with us. He would have never sacrificed his son at the altar on the cross just to simply destroy us. This proves his love for us as a people to this day. And he will continue to show us our sin. He will convict our hearts in hopes that we will then turn to that sacrifice, to the cross, to Jesus, and receive it as a gift of grace so that we can then live out his true purpose for our lives. Verse 24, and the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. So take note of that, because even though the Lord blesses this child, he's still going to make really dumb decisions. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahana Dan, between Zorah and Eshtael. We know of Samson that he has this supernatural strength and this will be the source of it. And the fact that the Lord began to stir, it means that it began to impel him to do the work of God. Now, remember, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, will not force us to do anything, but he will stir within us to impel us to do stuff. He will guide us into his will. But we still ultimately, in the end, have the choice of whether or not we will follow that and we will see whether or not Samson does. Chapter 14, this is going to tell us about Samson's first and failed marriage. So when we were taking notes from his parents' good marriage, now we're going to take notes of his failed marriage, Samson's. So Samson went down to Timnah, which is northwest of Judah. And at Timnah, okay, so Timnah is actually in the tribe of Dan. That's their territory. So it's kind of right on the border of Judah and Dan. He saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Okay, so first of all, we see here already that he has got a weakness for women. He went down, he saw a woman, he's self-centered. He is obviously worldly willing to uh, play with the Philistines, even though he knows he probably shouldn't. And then he's disrespectful to his parents. So we're already seeing his character. The very first thing that he says, he is speaking against his parents. Verse three, but his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all of our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? So Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. So this is validating once again his disrespect 
and his self-centeredness. So Verse four, his father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. Moral of the story is don't use God's goodness to justify your sin or don't use his grace to justify uh, your willingness to continue to live in sin. Verse five, then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah and they came to the vineyards of Timnah and behold, a young lion came toward him roaring. And I'm like, uh oh, don't do it, Samson. The fact that he's by the vineyards is already showing that he's playing with fire. I mean, he knows he's not supposed to drink alcohol, which is what will be at the vineyard. So he is dancing around sin already. And then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. So giving him strength. And although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a goat. Now, the enemy is not something that we can fight on our own strength. Now, let's just stop here and let this be a reminder to us that the enemy is not something that we can be dealing with or fighting with on our own strength. This is why it is so important for us to seek an anointing daily, to seek the Lord early in the day so that when we come up to the lion who is seeking to devour, we will be ready to fight not on our own power or might, but by the spirit of the Lord. So mistake number one, he is in a place that he shouldn't be. Mistake number two, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Bearing false witness, having the right information, wrong implication. Verse seven, then he went down and talked with the woman and she was right in Samson's eyes. So then he goes and plays with fire once again. He falls to his own temptation. He goes down and simply talks to the woman. Oh, it's just talking. It's just an innocent conversation, which will quickly lead to their then being right in his eyes. And he's going to develop a lust that he really can't overcome. Verse eight, after some days he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out into his hands and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. Why? Because with the Nazarite vow, you are not supposed to touch anything that is dead because you're supposed to be set apart and clean, always ready for the service of God. So he's doing some good things here, but also right in the midst of his own uh, sin. So I wrote here, kill the lion, share the honey. And this is in relation to a message that Charles Spurgeon once gave. He compared this to Jesus and the way that Jesus conquered death and hell, the way that Samson defeated this lion. And of course, we know Jesus is laden with sweetness, just the way that this lion had honey in its belly. We too should share the honey with others the way that Samson did. And of course, he brought it to his family first. So we should bring the gospel to those who are closest to us first and also bring it in a practical and a simple way. We don't need to try to have smoke and mirrors and fancy lights and sound. We can bring it with whatever is in our hand. We've been talking about that with the ox goat, whatever tool, what is in your hand. Samson simply had his bare hands bringing home this honey and he brought it humbly. Samson didn't boast about the lion and the fact that he slayed this giant. He simply brought the honey. Verse 10, then his father went down to the woman and Samson prepared a feast there for the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. So here we see that he is throwing a drunken party, as we call it in Hawaii, a rager. And this is basically his bachelor party. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within seven days of the feast and find it out, then I'll give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. So these linen garments are valuable. They're expensive. They're the fine linens that were made and worn by women. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. So this is showing that Samson is pretty intelligent. The fact that he came up with this riddle. But of course, we know he's also very dumb in the sense that he is morally weak. Now, riddles are spoken of 21 times, or at least the word is spoken of 21 times in the Old Testament. 11 of those 21 times is right here in chapter 14. 
And the word riddle actually means enigmatic saying or a mis mysterious saying. And we'll see later on that Sheba will also test Solomon with riddles. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you in your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? Well, they're saying this because they're, they're really threatened. The fact that they would have to come up with these expensive linens, it would put them into a place of poverty. So now this puts Samson's wife in a place of fear because she feels threatened because they're serious. They're like, we will burn you and your house, your father's house with fire. Verse 16, and Samson's wife wept over him and said, you only hate me. You don't love me. You have put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, behold, I have not told my father nor my mother. And shall I tell you? So she wept before him seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he ended up telling her because she pressed him hard. So she manipulates him here. We are seeing the weaknesses of both Samson and his wife here. Samson in the case that he is weak when it comes to women and he ends up telling her the meaning of this riddle, which will work against him. And also his wife using manipulation to try to get her way, which in the end we will see it will backfire. And manipulation is something that can oftentimes and most times will work short term. You'll get what you want but it will often poison the relationship and also the situation. So let's do a heart check here. Are you in a situation right now that you are trying to manipulate? You're trying to get your way. You're going beyond what God has said. You're being impatient. And so you are trying to work in order to get what you want. Then she told the riddle to her people and the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. So he is angry now about the fact that he was manipulated, but also that his wife then went and sided with these men. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and he went down to Ashkelon which is one of, the fine, uh, one of the five main Philistine cities, and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil. So he strikes down uh, 30 Philistine men to take their clothing, gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. And in hot anger, he went back to his father's house and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. So he goes out and he murders a bunch of Philistines, again, sinful. He is moving against the Philistines here, which is showing that uh, he is, I guess, in a sense, doing God's will. God is using it for his good. But at the same time, Samson is sinning. And not only that, but he loses his wife in the end. She leaves him for his best man. So he paid off the bet, but it was at the expense of the Philistines. So he won the battle, but he in the end lost the war. So I took some notes here of Samson's failed marriage. First of all, it was based on feelings. It was love at first sight, which most times will not work. If you base your marriage on love at first sight, you're basing it on feelings alone and not on the actual person because it's impossible to really know a person from the get-go, just from first sight. Uh, not saying this can't work. I know a lot of people who actually had this love at first sight and their marriages lasted. They were also unequally yoked. He should not have married a Philistine woman or tried to in any sense of the word. And this goes for us as Christians too. There's a reason why the Lord says not to be unequally yoked. And this is speaking about marrying a non-Christian. And the reason why is because if you are not in, agree in agreement with the most important decision of your life, which is knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will likely be in a dis in disagreement over many other of the foundational things that go into a marriage. Um, it doesn't mean that it can't work. <clears throat> I also know many people who have married non-Christians and their marriages work. So that is something that you cannot give up on the way that the wife did here. She gave up on her marriage. It was not founded on godly principles. It was manipulative and it Samson therefore responded in anger. He didn't respond in love. And of course, we know that she sided with others against her husband. This is a big one where we will go and talk to our family, talk to our friends, talk to somebody of the opposite sex about our spouse. And that only leads to destruction in the end. 
Chapter 15, we're going to see Samson defeating the Philistines in retaliation for what has just happened. So after some days at the time of the wheat harvest, which is sometime in late May or early June, as this is congruent with the Feast of Weeks or the Pentecost, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat, so bringing her some sort of gift. And he said, I will go into my wife in the chamber, but her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion, or in other words, his best man. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to him, this time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes. But we now know that this is likely to be jackals because foxes don't run in packs like this. So likely to be jackals in order for him to have picked up 300 of them and took torches. And he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain, as well as the olive orchards. Then the Philistine said, Who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So here we are seeing the literal backfiring of what she was afraid of in the first place. She initially was afraid of her people, setting her and her father's house on fire up here, but now she is being burned up. And this is so ironic that uh, this is the reason why she manipulated Samson in the first place, and now it's being turned on her head. And Samson said to them, if this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you, and after that I will quit. So he is retaliating here, which we know retaliation is never the answer. It never wins. You know, God gave Jesus even though we deserved death and we too should be those who give forgiveness when people come against us. The Bible says we should turn the other cheek when someone slaps us. You can take a look at that. Matthew 5, I believe this is what it is speaking of. And he struck them hip and thigh. So meaning top to bottom in a cruel and unsparing way with a great blow. And he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Edom. Then the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? They said, we have come up to bind Samson to do to him as he did to us. Then 3000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? So it's interesting here that they're basically saying Philistines rule over us and we kind of like it that way. It's probably something that Samson doesn't want to hear. What then is it that you have done to us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. And they said to him, we've come down to bind you, that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. So just the way that we saw in chapter 12, brother fighting against brother, civil war breaking out among the Israelites, we are seeing a breakdown in the church, essentially, where we are of one thought. We all know that we are children of God. We are saved by Jesus. And that should indeed unite us just the way that these tribes should be united. But here now they're fighting against each other. And I feel like this is a foreshadowing of what happens to the church and what is currently happening in the church, where denomination is fighting against denomination. People of this church is fighting against people of this church. Just because these people don't believe in the way that this person preaches, they start attacking these people over here. And Satan is having a heyday in all of this. He is loving the fact that we are becoming disunited, that we are going to ultimately fall down upon ourselves because we are not maintaining the unity that God intended. And this is something I'm really passionate about. I really believe that we have got to be better as Christian brothers and sisters to be loving and encouraging one another and not tearing each other down. Because even if we don't agree on some of the fundamental things and what the Bible says and the way that we interpret it, if we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, that he forgives us of our sins, that we are saved by grace, not by works, if we believe in that foundation alone, that in itself should be enough to keep us together and to be able to lovingly then have conversations. But in so many cases today, we're seeing, sadly, that is not the case. 
So the people of Judah said to him, No, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. And the fact that they were even able to bind him up just shows that he was submitted and willing to allow them to do this because we know that when the Spirit comes upon him, he has supernatural strength. So this is showing his faith and his trust in God in this case. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and put out his hand and took it. And with it, he struck 1000 men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down a thousand men. So here we see him now taking credit for what has just happened. Now, we know that a jawbone is something that is tough and resilient. It is unbreakable. But in the face of the Philistines and their mighty weapons and the things that they have that are so much more advanced than what any Israelite could ever have, and especially against the jawbone of a donkey, we see here that once again, God is using the most foolish things to become mighty, just the way that he used the ox goad with Shamgar, the way that he'll use a slingshot with David. And he does things like this so that he can confound the wise. And we see an example of this or this scripture in itself written in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 27. So imagine what Samson could have been. Imagine what he could have done if he had actually yielded to God and not his own desires, not his own lusts and passions. Verse 17, as soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand, and that place was called Ramath Lehi, which means hill of the jawbone. And he was very thirsty, and he called upon the Lord and said, you have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant. So now he is giving God credit, but here he wasn't. He was taking credit for this victory. By the hand of your servant, and I shall now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. So God allowed him to become thirsty because a lot of the times following a victory, we will become so uh, high up on ourselves that we will need almost a, t a trial to then temper the victory. He needed a reminder of his weakness so that he would then turn back to the Lord. And that's exactly what happened here. And God split open the hollow place that is at Lehi and water came out from it. And when he drank, his spirit returned and he was revived. Therefore, the name of it was called en -Hakore. It is as Lehi to this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. So en -Hakore means the spring or the well of him who called or cried. Samson is known as one of the most wicked, if not the most wicked judges of this time. And it was interesting because I asked my husband today, when you think about Samson, what do you think of his character? And he immediately said all of the things that we spoke of today, that he was self-centered, he was arrogant, he was prideful. And then he said, and he was strong and had muscles. And it was interesting today because I had a different perspective. The fact that a lot of people will ask where Samson gets his strength from may have shown that he actually may have not been such a big muscle dude after all, that he may have actually looked pretty ordinary, which would make sense as to why people would ask where his strength came from. Because if he was walking around with big old muscles, it wouldn't be a question where his strength came from. But regardless, even though he may have been wicked, self-centered, arrogant, prideful, all of these things and committed tons of sin, he still ends up in the hall of faith. Once again, giving us hope that even as sinful as we might be, when we come in repentance and when God chooses us, he can use us for a beautiful and a greater purpose. And I believe that he wants that for every single one of us. I've seen it in my own life. I have messed up. I have done horrible things. Yet God still called my name. He still chose me to do his work. 
And I'm so grateful for that. And there's no turning back from it. When you hit rock bottom and God truly clothes you with those robes of righteousness and he picks you up and he holds you in his arms and he tells you you are forgiven and he tells you you are a different person. He calls you by a different name that he doesn't call you by sinner. He doesn't call you by unworthy one. He doesn't call you by shame. He doesn't call you by fear. He doesn't call you by outcast. He calls you daughter, son, beloved, child. He calls you the most intimate names that a father could call his children. And those names are reserved for you. So we thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of our sin, our mess ups, our calamity, Lord, you are still able and willing to use us. That there is nothing that we can do that will ever thwart your plan. We aren't strong enough for that. We aren't big enough for that. We aren't even good enough for that. You are good. You are powerful. You are in control and you will ultimately have your will be done. And so we surrender our lives to that today, Lord. We thank you that we are even here today, that you called our name and that we have come in obedience to once and for all stay here in this place and never look back never go back lord give us the strength to stay on this road with you help us to be a humble servant of you and thank you for the life of samson thank you for showing us lord what to do what not to do thank you for giving us examples of good marriages and of bad marriages help us lord to be united with those that we love for husbands and wives lord i pray for marriages today to come together in unity i pray for the husbands and wives who are watching this lord that they will understand what they need to do in this time to be able to create a fruitful and a healthy marriage speak to them individually lord for those who might be single lord i pray that you'll prepare their hearts for the day that they might meet their match lord and for those who say i don't ever want to get married lord i just pray that you will be the ultimate relationship that they will ever want to know i love you so much lord thank you for this time thank you for giving us the desires of our heart when we delight ourselves in you we honor you we praise you in jesus name amen heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace we're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.